table of contents, the zero product property. All right, zero product property tells us that if two factors have a product of zero, then either of the two factors themselves can be equal to zero. All right. So if I tell you that two numbers A and B are equal to zero, it could be the A that's zero, it could be just the B that's zero, it could be both the A and the B that are equal to zero. All right. That's all the zero product property is telling us. All right. I could do it on Desmos. A times B. It asks for sliders, but that's okay. Oh, I'm sorry, A times B. I don't need to put the equal zero part because if I put one of the values at zero, if I can get it to stay there, I'll just type it, equal zero. Put one of the values at zero, it doesn't matter where I put the other value, the product is still always gonna be zero. All right, I could do it in the reverse where I put the B value zero uh, to zero, and you see, if they're both zero, the product is zero. That, that's easy enough. But if I make the B value equal to zero, then it doesn't matter where I, wherever I put the A value, the product is always going to be zero. Even if I put that A value on zero itself, all right, the product will always be equal to zero. All right, so that's a piece of information that we could use when solving quadratics. Because if we know the factors of a quadratic, like for example, this one distributed out, number one. If we distributed that out, we'd get a polynomial, but it's already factored for us, right? We have a factor form here. So what they're telling us is that this first factor here is the A, that second factor is the B, and the product is zero, all right? What that means is that if I take the A and set it equal to zero, or I take the B and set it equal to zero, I'll get a true sentence either way, or a true relationship. The first one, I, there's really nothing to do. Once I state that X is equal to zero, I know X is equal to zero. All right. But the other one, I just have to add five to both sides. So I get x equals 5, you know, a little cancellation there, all right. So I get x is equal to 0 or x is equal to 5, all right. That's the mathematical definition of the word or, which is always kind of weird because we tend to think of or as being a choice between two things. We really or is a set of all possibilities. All right, so if I tell you that you're gonna do a project, I mean, I'm, this is hypothetical, you know, I'm not actually announcing a project. You will do a project, but it's just, this is not my way of telling you that. All right, but if I say you're gonna do a project and you can either make a video, uh, write a paper, do a demonstration, a live demonstration, or make a PowerPoint, all right? There's no reason to think that you have to do all of those things. You would just do one of those things, all right? But I still have to present you with all four of those options. I have to give you the choices, but you'll make one selection, all right? So in a lot of ways, the, the case of or is really just making a list of all the possible cases that could exist. It's kind of like when we were listing out all the factors of the C value. You know, what are, what are two numbers that multiply to 60, for example? I'd, I'd write one and 60, two and 30. I, I'd list out all the options. But then once I've done that, I'd go and make a selection from those options. That's what's happening here. So when we write the or, this is really just a list of all the options that satisfy the equation. All right. I'll show you how you can do all this pretty easily on Desmos in a minute. A couple minutes. All right.
But number two, not much more complicated. We still have two factors. One is the A, the other is the B. You don't have to refer to them as the A and the B values as long as you know that you have two factors that are multiplying to zero, that it could be the first factor that's equal to zero, or it could be the second factor that's equal to zero. Solve each one, add five, subtract three, little properties of equality going on here. So x is equal to 5 or x is equal to negative 3. And again, all that's saying is either 5 or negative 3 would satisfy this equation. Pack it. Yeah, it's on the, the file cabinet in the back. So we don't have to, you could write or, or that symbol, right? Or that symbol, yeah. So then we have to get to, uh, or we have to start thinking about how we could get to the factored form. Uh, if you already have it in factored form, that's great. Then you just take each of your factors, set them equal to zero, and, and go for it. But if it's not already in factored form, that's, that's where the previous unit comes into play. You, you would then have to factor. So that's where this example comes into play. Um, so it's kind of weird. I didn't make an edit on your paper, I don't think. But where it says the standard form is, that should say the general form. However, for whatever reason, the, the Regents folks refer to this as a standard form. So they think that this is the right way to say it. It's not the standard form, it's the general form. Right? So, um, but I'll take it as a typo. I do it every year, I just never change it. Yeah. Yeah, you could do that. I mean, it's wrong, but that's what they call it. So in a, in a manner of speaking, in, on some level, it must be right to somebody. Yeah. We'll get into what the actual standard form is, but that's not it. But they keep calling it that. I don't know why. So anyway. Uh, looking at the example, uh, you, you can read the steps, but basically you can't apply the zero product property unless your equation is equal to zero. This one's equal to six, so you don't just look at it and say, well, the property doesn't apply. I can't do the work, so skip. No, you, you can manipulate the equation so that it is equal to zero. The, o the only thing I would have to do is subtract a six from both sides. So knock off the 6 by subtraction. It cancels on the right. It's not a like term with anything on the left. So the best I can do here is rewrite it. x squared minus x minus 6 in descending order. And now the whole thing's equal to 0, which is good because I have a trinomial that's factorable. All right, so now I just got to be thinking about two numbers that are going to multiply to negative 6 that are also going to add to a negative 1. All right, so you can make the list out. You could do the trial and error, but hopefully you're, you're getting closer and closer to the point where you can do some of this in your head, especially for the simpler cases. If the leading coefficient is not equal to 1, it should be pretty easy. I'm sorry, if it, the leading coefficient is not equal. If the leading coefficient is equal to 1, it should be pretty easy. So I'm thinking two numbers that multiply to negative 6, like 2 and 3, one of them negative. If I make the 3 negative and the 2 positive, that'll give me a sum of negative 1. All right, so I would have my two factors. So then it's a matter of taking those two factors, setting each of them equal to zero, and solving for the values, values of x. So 
So x minus 3 is equal to 0, or x plus 2 is equal to 0. Use properties of equality to solve for x. In each case, should be pretty straightforward. You get x is equal to 3, or x is equal to negative 2. And those would be your solutions. Now, if this is multiple choice, you could do it a different way. Uh, it, it's more a graphical approach. There, there's functions in a TI calculator. And eventually, we have to make the complete shift over to TI from the Desmos because that's just the way the Regents is. But we can still use Desmos for the assessments. But you know, like we, we want to be able to use both. All right, so I'll show you the TI approach. It's a graphical approach, and it's really more suited for the next unit. But, but I could show you now. Because it'll, it'll just flat out give you the answer, which is nice. It's actually three different ways to do it. One way works all the time, but it's a little bit more complicated. One way is very easy, but it doesn't work all the time. I just got to turn this off. This is for my stack class. Yeah, very easy, but it doesn't work all the time. So it's like, well, that's great. You know, like, why would we do that? Uh, most people try the easy way first. If they get lucky and they get it right, or they get the answer, then they don't have to try the more complicated way. All right. But basically what you're going to do is you're going to type in the left side of your equation into y1. All right. So this whole thing here, this guy right here, that's going to go in for y1 in your TI calculator. If it's a Desmos calculator, you just type in equation uh, n equation y equals all that. I'll do that in a minute. I'll do a demonstration for that. All right. So x squared minus x minus 6. All right. So we start off with the easy way. All right. So what you're looking for in the table is any instance in which the y value is equal to 0. All right. Because if we really think about it, just looking at the notation, I'm typing in x squared minus x minus 6 into y1. x squared minus x minus 6 should be equal to 0. If I'm saying y, or y1 in this case, is the same thing as x squared minus x minus 6, then logically I'm saying y1 has to be the same as 0. It's a form of equality. It's like if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, wouldn't we say that A is equal to C? And if they're all equal, so any, any of them could be equal to one another. All right, so what we would do to verify is we go into the table, second graph, and look for any instance in which a Y1 value is equal to zero. That happens when X is equal to negative two, and it happens when X is equal to positive three. Nice and easy. But there's a pretty substantial flaw here. What if your x value is fractional? Yeah. If you don't have a sense of what kind of fraction it is, you wouldn't be able to alter your table structure so that it would show the appropriate solutions. You can make your x column go by half units, by quarter units, by third units, whatever. But if you don't know enough to make it go by that, then, then it's not going to show up. And then also, Throw in the fact, what if your answer is irrational? Like some sort of funky radical number, right? Not going to show up in the table, right? So nice and easy, but doesn't always work. I'm sorry, how did you get that? Again, I put in the y value, but how did you get that? Second graph. Got it? Right. So let me show you another way. All right. So another way involves looking at looking at the graph itself, all right? So you could do that by hitting graph, but that's dangerous. It's almost always uh, not the right way to go because if your window isn't set up perfectly for your graph, you would have a problem. Like, uh, let's see, 
that's what mine looks like when I hit graph because I changed my window for my stat class and now it's, it, well, it's not consistent with what I need it for here. All right, so zoom is the better way to create a graph, all right, visually, because it gives you a different, a bunch of different options depending on what kind of uh, information you have plugged into the calculator. We can all, we, we're almost always gonna start off with a standard zoom and then change from there. So Z standard, zoom standard, that's option six. So zoom followed by option six. That gives you the ordinary negative 10 to 10 window. All right, negative 10 to 10 on the x-axis, negative 10 to 10 on the y-axis. And it also makes the tick marks go by ones. All right, so also pretty easy in the sense that you can just look. Now, what are you looking for? You're looking for instances in which the graph crosses the x-axis. Because what, what we really have here, just based on the notation, y1 is replacing that whole function, x squared minus x minus 6 y1 is therefore equal to zero. But y1 is really a y equation. It's just the first one, which is why it has a subscript. All right. So when I go into y equals, all the y1, y2, y3, they're all y equals. It's just this is the first y that I have in there. This is my second, my third, and so on. y equals zero is a horizontal line, specifically the x-axis. So when I set an equation equal to zero, I'm looking for the instances in which it crosses the x-axis. Right? That happens here and here. Right? But again, it brings us back to the whole thing with the table. What if it's, what if it's not clear? What if it's a fractional value? Even worse, what if it's a radical value that's close enough to a whole number that you think it's a whole number, but it's not. Like I look at this and I say, oh, that's three, but it turns out that it's 3.000159, blah, blah, blah. You're like, ah, oh, I was so close, you know, but still wrong, All right? So how do we fix that? Well, what we do is we take this zero here and put that into Y2. <laughs> All right, so in my y equals, I put this in y, I put a zero in y2. Now I have two equations, all right? I hit graph, nothing changed. Okay, so you're like, great, that was very helpful. Nothing changed because y equals zero is a horizontal line right on the x-axis. It graphed a new line, it's just not visible because it's overlapping with a line that's already there. What I want to do is find the intersection between these two curves. All right, the problem is I'm going to get two answers. All right, so I got to do this process twice. So what we do is we use second trace five and then scroll to the intersection. and hit enter three times. This is a really weird way of writing it, but it's there. All right, so I'm gonna go second, trace, trace is right next to graph. All right, so second trace option five, right on down to intersect. Bunch of other features there, but the one we want is intersect, option five. Select that one. Now, it says first curve. It'll say first curve, second curve, and guess. I'm not really worried about that just yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll as close as I can to the intersection. All right, Intersection between the curve and the horizontal line, y equals 0, which, again, we have to just know is the x-axis. All right. So, and actually, I'll just show you real quick. Let me, let me just pause my demonstration. You don't have to do this. I just want to show you that it's actually there. I'm just turning off the axes. All right, so I turned off the X and Y axis. You see the, the, the line Y equals zero is actually really there. It's just hidden 
behind the x-axis or above it, right? So anyway, second trace five, scroll as close as you can to the intersection point. It'll say first curve because it, wa it wants to make sure that it's finding the intersection between the two curves that you want it to find the intersection between. All right. So in the top left-hand corner, it'll say, all right, this is the function I'm on right now. Y equals X squared minus X minus, minus six. Is that correct? Yes. Hit enter. All right. The second one that you want to find the intersection between is Y equals zero. Is that correct? Yes. Hit enter. All right. Since we're only going to have two curves or two lines or whatever on the graph displayed at any given time, you can just hit enter three times. The guess is weird. It's just saying get as close as you can to the actual value and then hit enter. It's Did you type in zero for Y2? Oh, no, I didn't type That's usually what happens. All right. When you hit enter a third time, it'll say intersection. It'll give you a coordinate. We're only interested in the X value. The y value we already know, it should be zero. It's on the x-axis, all right? But then, so now I have one solution. I just need the, the next one. Let me just get a snip of this. I'll put it right in. So we just do it again. Second, trace five. Then we go to the other point and then hit enter three times. And it says intersection of three. All right, well, three, zero, but we only care about the three. All right, so you can get your answers. I mean, this way is a lot more, call it convoluted, but it's still doable. You know, if you're in a jam and you can't figure out the factors and you just have one more question on a multiple choice assessment to go, what's the harm in doing it this way, all right? Because you could see problems like uh, numbers three and four at the bottom there. You know, one's definitely more complicated looking than the other, but they both involve factoring in some capacity. To know that you can come up with the answers isn't really that bad. Right. Uh, the Desmos approach, same but different as usual. So if you do it on Desmos, you still type in your two equations, y equals, you don't have to do y1, x squared minus x minus 6 and then y equals 0 then you just tap on the two intersections I mean if only we could use Desmos on the regions I mean that's so much more convenient but it is what it is all right so number three we're solving the equation again if we're doing it by hand we're getting everything over to the same side because in order in order to apply the zero product property, your equation has to be set equal to zero, right? So subtract x, subtract x, cancels on the right-hand side, cancels down to a zero. They're not like terms, so it's just seven x squared minus x. So now I just have to factor and solve this. I mean, easier said than done in a lot of cases. This one's not bad because I see a common X across the two terms. That means that there's a GCF here, all right? Factoring skills are still in play here. GCF of X, numerical values, I don't see one, uh, or GCF. So I'm just gonna divide out the X. Again, we hang on to the GCF, we don't lose it. It's kind of like if I were to say, give me two numbers that multiply to 15. And you're like, well, five's in the number 15, so I guess five is one of them. How do I get the other? I take the 15, divide it, divide it by the five, and I get a three. You don't just toss the five. Five times three is 50. Those are the two numbers that multiply to 15. You need them both, all right? So here it's give me two numbers that multiply to seven X squared minus X. One of them is X. What's the other, all right? The other is seven X minus one, but we don't toss the X because I still need the two values to multiply to give me seven X squared minus X, all right? That's one of those things I figure if I repeat it often enough, then it'll, it'll stick, but 
people still lose the GCF when they factor it out. So I'm just going to keep on, keep on keeping on. Now my two factors, I'm going to set each one equal to zero. So x equals zero, nice and easy. Or 7x minus 1 is equal to zero. This is our first instance where we're going to get a fractional answer. Right? When you have a leading coefficient other than 1, that's usually what happens. Right? Not always, but most of the time. All right, so I'm going to add a 1 to both sides. 7x is equal to 1. Divide out the 7. And I get x is equal to 1 7th. So x is equal to 0 or x is equal to 1 7th. All right, that's the issue. It's not going to come up in the table. If you use a table approach in a calculator, you're not going to get the 1 7th to appear in your x list. All right, so you need another method if you're going to use a, a, a graphing calculator. And so that's why I show the intersect function. Right. So whether you use Desmos or, or the other, uh, clearly it's easier to do on Desmos, but even with the Desmos approach, if you don't recognize the des decimal for what it is, that could be tricky also. All right. So if I typed in 7x squared minus x, oops, went too fast. I can get my intersection here. One of them is nice and easy. The other says 0.1429. If I wrote 0.1429 down, I would be wrong. Because right? it's an exact value. One seventh is that number. Right? So if you don't recognize that it's actually a particular decimal value associated with a fraction, then that could, that could be a problem. Right? So there are pros and cons either way. And then we get to number four more traditional looking, right? But again, you don't want anything other than zero on the right-hand side, right? or on any one side of the equation. So I'm gonna add five to both sides. Now I do have some like terms that I can combine. x squared minus 11x plus 24. You go through your list looking for different options that are going to multiply to 24, but also add to 11. You do, you, you do the usual things like 12 and 2, 6 and 4, you're like, I'm not going to get to an 11 from that. But 8 and 3 will get you to an 11 if they're both negative. Well, negative 11. So then we set each factor equal to 0. and solve. So we get x is equal to 8 or x is equal to 3. And you can see every other question is kind of structured the same way. All right? So it's really nothing more than that. It's just it, it's going to come down to your ability to factor. All right? The good thing is that since you have the technology to support your work here, you can get an idea of what the answer is supposed to be, what the two factors are supposed to be before you get started. And then you can use that to help kind of clue you in on what you're looking for. Like, let's say you were struggling to come up with the negative 8 and negative 3. You're like, oh, I don't know what those factors are. Then pop it into a calculator, see what the answer is supposed to be, and then use that to build your factors. It would just be a question of what's positive and what's negative, but that should be pretty reasonable. All right. uh, so <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to uh, just finish through page three for homework. Classwork homework, yeah. You have about 10 minutes. So. A bunch of problems, but it's good practice. You got to get solid with this factoring stuff. Otherwise, it's going to be a hindrance the rest of the way.